like Laura said, I'm a relatively new Googler. Uh, I joined about a year ago. And uh, I'm a site reliability manager, which means that I am responsible for a team that uh, runs some Google services. And the, uh, uh, when I joined the company, and really the, 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 the story of this talk is when I joined the company, I needed to figure out how the organization worked. And of course, um, I'd been involved in this conference for a couple of years. I've been involved in system management things. Prior to that, we have the book. There's been a lot of discussion of all of the, the sort of core Google processes, but there are certain aspects of it that, that didn't quite, I didn't quite understand exactly how they could work based on the previous organizations that I'd worked in. And when I got to Google, I found that these things actually fit together in a, a very coherent sort of organizational architecture. And so, um, you know, basically what happened over the course of the last year is that I've been trying to sort of tease apart why these things are so, so effective at Google. And, uh, and that's really what this talk is about. So, um, you know, at, you presumably all sort of know what Google SRE is. Um, the, the best description of it that I have heard so far is that um, it is a, uh, a staffing carve out dedicated to reliability, right? It's an investment in reliability as a, as a core value of the organization. And it's a parallel organization. It's completely separate from the product organization. And it has a different set of deliverables and, a, um, and it works in concert with but independently from the product organization. OK, so for the talk overall, um, I'm going to talk about what I found to be uncommon Google values. Um, you know, as I started to work with the organization, I, I realized that there were certain values that aren't completely foreign from other companies, but they're taken to uh, a little bit more of an extreme than, uh, than I had seen elsewhere. Uh, they're, they're taken maybe more seriously is, is the best way to think about it. And so I'll go through a couple of these. And then I'll talk about the SRE tactics that we all sort of know and love at this point uh, through this lens, because I think that it's a useful way to, to really understand how they work from a nuts and bolts perspective. And then I'll talk about what this means for adoption elsewhere. So there are a lot of different sort of uncommon values that Google has. It's a, it's a very uh, particular sort of organization. There are, of course, the beanies, which I think made it into a movie at some point. Um, but there are, there are a lot of things uh, that I think really, um, really distinguish the organization. And, and SRE uh, is, I think, best understood as a reflection of these values, because all organizations are, are really defined by, by their values, right? So the, the way that I'm talking about values here you know, I was trying to come up with a good visual for values while I was working on the talk, and I did a Google image search, and I ended up with, you know, values is one of these terms that has become completely meaningless, right? Because it is used for so many different things, and it's so vague. But really, the way that I'm thinking about values is the way that um, people in an organization behave when it's not easy, right? Um, you know, really, when the chips are down, when things are, are, are difficult for one reason or another, how does the organization actually act? Not just what are the slogans that are up on the walls. Um, and so, you know, uh, what I found is that there are really three values that are, are the most important here. The first of these is that reliability is paramount. And this is a, a very serious um, investment in reliability as a first class goal of, of the system. Um, oh, one thing about these, uh, uh, these values, this is my assessment of the values that make Google SRE sort of what it is as an outsider that didn't build SRE. I've been at the company less than a year. I can't take responsibility for any of this. I'm more akin to an anthropologist sort of coming in and viewing this through, through the lens of, of, uh, uh, of, it, of an outsider. That probably won't last too much longer, right? Because you get sort of incorporated over time. But, uh, but that's sort of where it is. Um, so, uh, for this first value, uh, reliability is, is paramount. And this really means that you take reliability very seriously, and there's a very reasoned process around it. So, of course, reliability is paramount except when it isn't, right? You can't always build everything with five nines or six nines, and, and it's a trap to assume that you can. But what's really important here is that you need to be able to, um, uh, to figure out how important reliability is versus, versus feature velocity, because that's frequently the trade-off that you're making. And uh, from there, you need to be able to then set a course. 
So, you know, I think all of you have probably seen uh, the cliche of a firefighter doing operations. The thing that I really love about this picture is that this firefighter's throwing down his hose, right? Um, one of the interesting things in the way that Google S3 works is that it explicitly recognizes this duality between toil and operational load on the one hand, putting out the fire, and proactively working to make sure that fires don't occur in the future. Right? And I think we've all probably been on operations teams at one point or another that have been completely overloaded but with a service that wasn't working right. And uh, there is far more work to do operationally than you can possibly keep up with. And at some you know, basic level, this isn't a sustainable situation. Right? And so when I think about the way that um, SRE works as an organization, distinguishing it from other operations organizations that I've participated in, the goal is that the hose gets thrown down, right? And instead, you move into uh, a regime where you're managing toil and operational load, right? So the, the, the basic rubric at, uh, at Google is that uh, you should only be spending 50% of your time on toil and operational load. And if you're not proactively working on improving your service, your service is in trouble at some basic level. So, the, uh, uh, the reason I chose this picture is that this really shows someone that is working proactively on a system. It is not on fire. They are keeping careful track of what they're doing, and they're being very deliberate about, about the process, right? This is engineering versus, uh, versus reaction, right? And so much of, of operations has really developed into a, a purely reactive kind of a discipline. So the, the core idea here uh, of... Uh, uh, of toil management is that at any given point in time, you have a fixed amount of, of, uh, of effort that you can spend. And you can spend that effort investing in the service, or you can spend that effort toiling and responding to pages or doing manual operations tasks or whatever your service requires. There's a fixed budget, right? So, so these are two lines that are parallel. And the, uh, um, the volume above the line is, is the, the conjugate of the, the volume below the line. And this is, this is explicitly a budget trade-off, right? Over time, your service is going to do things. That's going to mean that your operational load trends up or down. And you need to control that. And uh, if you don't, your toil will expand, right? We've all seen services that just incrementally get a little bit worse every week because there's something that's overloaded and, uh, and, and eventually you're in a situation where you just can't keep up. And so the, the first thing is to understand that there's one budget, and if you're not working on toil, you can be investing. And, and once you understand that, then you can start to make decisions about how you're investing the, the effort that you have to work on reliability. And the second idea here is that the investments that you make um, contribute to this virtuous cycle, where the time that you spend improving the service reduces your costs, which gives you more time to improve the service, which improves the service and reduces the costs, right? And so this is, this is a, a, a feedback cycle that's fantastic when it works, but it doesn't happen for free, and it needs to be protected. And so at, at some basic level, you need to uh, consciously work towards this kind of an architecture, and if you, uh, if you don't, you won't get it for free. This doesn't naturally occur. So reliability priority is, is really really the key here. I think um, you need to focus on uh, how you get to reliability, not a particular process, right? Many, many operations organizations that I've seen have been focused on tactics, and uh, there are, and, and so, for example, many operations teams do on-call, and that is the, the definition of, of what, uh, uh, what their, their, their sort of um, reason for existence is. And, and I think that uh, Google takes a little bit of a step back one of the things that can happen to Google services is, is they can be managed by dev teams, right? And it's viewed as completely fine for a dev team to manage a service. In that case, SRE teams might fun function basically as consultants who come in and do design reviews and help with um, engineering approaches that will make sure that the service is more reliable, though they don't necessarily need to take the pager, right? There's a lot of different ways that you can contribute uh, reliability engineering expertise to an organization without necessarily answering pages. And I think it's important to, to understand that however you can best uh, serve the, the interests of, of reliability is the best way to act, not necessarily taking one particular kind of a task or another. 
right? The second thing that's, that's really important about this priority is that it, it puts reliability on an equal footing with features, right? There's this fundamental trade-off where uh, when you look at why systems break, they frequently break because we change them one way or another and we didn't understand some implication of the change. And so that means that there is a trade-off of, of reliability with features. The faster you move, the more you're gonna break things and the more that you're gonna need to, to toil to get the system into a decent state and engineer the system to avoid those issues in the future. And so you need some sort of feedback loop that can, can sort of address this. And at a high level, uh, this whole discussion um, guides the investment trade-off discussion with the product eng uh, organization. So uh, this needs to be a, an ongoing negotiation because if you, if you aren't having a regular dialogue about where the product needs to go and how it's working from a reliability perspective, you can't come to consensus. And, and consensus is really an important aspect of this. So at a high level, there's a couple of uh, uh, guidelines that help a lot to, uh, um, to, to get this uh, sort of um, approach into place. So, the SRE organization is going to ha necessarily have a different set of skills. They have uh, different, um, uh, different sort of base skills that they work with, and they have different experiences that they bring from having run systems, generally speaking, at larger scale. Um, and so if you look at uh, the kinds of work that the SRE team should be taking on into its backlog, you want to prioritize work where SRE is more effective for one reason or another. That can either mean that they can get the work done more quickly, uh, or it can mean that uh, they get the work done in a better way because they know more about you know, understanding failure modes of systems or the way to instrument a system in order to be able to service it or, or things like that. It's worth noting that one interesting difference between, uh, or one, one interesting aspect of the Google SRE organization is that the, the SRE organization is highly leveraged. So there's generally an end to one ratio of uh, product engineers, uh, SWEs, software engineers, to SREs. And what that ends up meaning is that just in terms of the overall budget that you have to get work done, you'll have more software engineer resources to get that done. And so when you're going to figure out where to put your SRE uh, resources, you should really prioritize where they're going to do the most good. And like I said, the, this, this ongoing priority management discussion uh, between the um, product organization and the site reliability um, team is really important here because at the end of the day, you're building a product and you, know, you have these, these two competing ideas coming in, right? So at the, at the extreme, the product organization wants to change things as quickly as possible and uh, the software engineer, or sorry, the site reliability engineering organization wants to change things as little as possible. These are completely incompatible, right? And what you need to do is, is bring these two perspectives together to find the, the right compromise between moving fast and, uh, um, and introducing unreliability into the system. And the other technique that's really important here is the ability to load shed back to the, the dev organization when it's needed, right? So at some point, you're gonna get overloaded. It, it happens. And at that, in that situation, there are a lot less resources in the SRE organization than in the product engineering organization. And so the only place that you can load shed to is, is, the, uh, um, is the product organization. And in order for this to actually work, um, both of these teams need to be on the same page with respect to priorities. So um, consider a scenario uh, where you have a service with high operational load. So what's happening? So, you know, week over week, the amount of, of effort that you're spending keeping the service working properly, dealing with maybe uh, topics that haven't been properly automated yet, or uh, incidents that occur, instability, um, is creeping up. Um, Toil is, is absolutely eating into the service improvement budget at this point. So uh, that, that ends up meaning that your ability to invest is, is going down, and, and you could end up in a, a, a serious issue here. And if you think about where the team is at this point, the team is getting more and more overloaded, right? So there's probably people that are, uh, you know, experiencing a lot of um, on-call load. So when they're doing an on-call shift, if they're getting lots of pages, uh, they, uh, um, uh, 
you know, it's just it's a very stressful situation. Um, I, I think um, Looney was telling me last night that they, they've done some studies of, uh, of where the stress comes from in on-call. And it's, it's not necessarily being paged, it's the expectation of being paged. And if you think about the psychological situation that happens here when your service is trending in the bad direction, you know that in, in the pit of your gut, right? You know if things are going in the right or the wrong direction. Everybody has an intuitive sense. And so what you're doing when you're on call is you're sort of sitting there and you're nervous. And that's going to be much more stressful. So at this point, you have a few options. So you can load shed back to the dev team, or you can just drop things off of your list. Um, you can say that there are particular things that you're not going to do. This can be hard in the case of, of operational toil, because this is putting the fire out, and it's in some sense, very easy, it's very obvious what to do when you have a fire. Go put out the fire. Um, that might not actually be the right long-term thing to do. It might be better to invest someplace else. And so it's worth you know, stepping back and, and understanding whether that's the right thing to do and if you should be load shedding instead. You can also load shed other parts of the priority list, but that's typically easier to do. So this means letting things go, go undone, back to the product team, and so forth. And if you don't do this kind of stuff, um, either you, you do more toil or you grow the team, right? And uh, one of the core precepts of, of Google SRE is that uh, we want sublinear growth. We don't want to add, um, you know, a new SRE per million lines or per, per sorry, I, I can't even use numbers here because I wouldn't know what the numbers are, but um, we can't add a new SRE per unit of lines of code or complexity in the service or, or so forth, right? So, so we, we want to... to um, uh, keep our, our, our growth um, uh, sort of bounded um, with pretty tight bounds. Okay, so uh, value two, precise promises. So this is sort of a strange topic to talk about. Any reliable organization is going to know how to make promises. I, I would actually argue that any organization that can't keep its own promises is going to uh, be in for a problem in the long term, right? But what I've been really struck by... Um, at Google is that uh, there's this, this notion of precision and promises. So um, I'll be talking about SLOs in a minute, but the, the basic notion here is that uh, the organization is very good at making and keeping promises. And not just making and keeping promises, but being very um, focused in expanding the range of the promises that they're making, being more specific about the promises, and being very, very accurate in, in what they're promising. And so this, this really underlies um, SLOs in a major way. So here's a, here's a graph that, that illustrates um, SLOs. So the SLO is the red line. Um, the, an SLI, which is a service level indicator, is the blue line. And you see that it's not a straight line. And there have been some problems with this service. Um, you know, at a high level, things look pretty good most of the time. But it's clear that the service is out of SLO for some period of time here. And if you think about what it means for the service to be out of SLO, this means that consumers of the service aren't getting the service that we're promising to them. Right? And so this is taken very seriously. Um, as, the, uh, as the service matures, what ends up happening is that more SLIs are added and more SLOs are added. And that means that the normal operating regime of the service is... Um, is localized into a narrower and narrower acceptable band, which means that the quality of systems that you can build on top of it improves because you understand where that system is going to be. Not that we always deliver exactly what we want to, but there's a, a strong feedback loop that, uh, that is built around this. So why have SLOs at all? So this, this is actually an interesting debate, right? SLOs are, are really um, a very core process of site reliability engineering at Google. And it's actually hard, if you talk to a longtime Googler and you, you ask them what Google SRE would look like without SLOs, it's completely unimaginable, right? This is, this is a, a very um, deep embedded notion of the way that the organization needs to work. And, and the, way that, the reason that this is so important is because SLOs are sort of a, a rendezvous mechanism for different teams to, to collaborate on building what you might call a microservice architecture, right? So you have a lot of different services, and they're all composed to build products. And the SLOs are the mechanisms through which the different teams understand what the other teams are offering. And if you're trying to build a service with five nines, and you're thinking about taking on a new dependency, and that dependency only has two nines, then you know that that may not be a very good idea, for example, right? And, and there, there are sort of processes to deal with that. 
So um, SLOs are also a risk management feedback loop. So if you think back to the, the, the diagram that I had on the previous page, when you see a service that is dipping below its SLO, you know that you need to be a little bit more careful around that prerequisite if you've, if you've taken that on as a dependency. And if a team is consistently not meeting their SLOs, one of two things is, is, is really true. Either the SLO is improperly set, and, and in fact, improperly set SLOs are a source of um, tumult for SRE teams. If they've poorly chosen their SLOs, then they can end up in a very, very bad state. Um, or, uh, you know, the other thing, the, 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 uh, the opposite can also be true. Uh, you can be in a situation where you set a low SLO, you've promised three nines, and you're delivering five nines. And so uh, there's a, uh, an interesting statistic that was uh, published in, um, Eric Brewer wrote a, a write-up of um, Spanner this year that was sort of a retrospective on the last five years of Spanner. And it, this is actually one of the best things I've read in the last year. It's really worth, worthwhile to read because it has a huge amount of um, operational experience in the document. And this is with real numbers, which is not a thing that you, you necessarily see. Um, but one of the things that he mentions in this is that uh, Chubby, which is the, the lock service that we use at Google, um, was delivering too high reliability. So they had an SLO, they were far exceeding that SLO. And what ends up happening when you far exceed an SLO, it's, it's a, a similarly bad problem to when you're under delivering on an SLO. Because if you far exceed your SLO, then your consumers expect that you're going to continue to deliver at your current level of service because they're not necessarily tracking the fact that you're, you're far exceeding your SLOs. And so their systems will end up um, being tuned for a level of performance that may not actually be sustainable. So maybe in the best circumstances, you can deliver five nines, but you're gonna fall back to three nines at some point when, when you take the wrong combination of activities, right, or the wrong uh, combination of failures. And so it's really, impro it's really important that these SLOs be calibrated um, to be reliable enough, but not too reliable. And so, so you need a real feedback loop to maintain these because if you think about any service, over time, the, uh, um, the range of, of likely outcomes from that system are going to change as the service gets more mature or it sits on top of different infrastructure or, or things change. And so this, this is a, a sort of a living um, feedback loop. And, and also this provides a basis for real negotiation between services and consumers. So imagine that you're in that situation that you're, you're building a 4.9 service and the thing that you're depending on or you want to depend on has a 3.9's SLO. Having an SLO that's explicit means that you can go to that team and, and, and open up a discussion about what it would take uh, in order to, to improve the SLO. And I mean, it's worth noting that these things aren't chosen arbitrarily, right? Um, anyone who's run a system knows that the first nine is the cheapest nine, right? The second nine is more expensive. And as you add more reliability, it gets increasingly expensive. And so you don't want to be setting uh, performance levels that are too high unless you have need to. And so if someone shows up and says, I have a legitimate need for this, this service to deliver more reliability, and here's the business case for it, then maybe you can justify the additional uh, expenditure that would be required in order to improve the, the reliability. But this isn't a decision that should be taken lightly. And so, so SLOs end up being this, this really interesting clearinghouse for the organization to negotiate what it's doing and why it's doing it, and, and specifically how well it's doing it, right? Um, you know, a lot of organizations think about reliability as a thing that they want you know, as, as sort of a motherhood and apple pie kind of thing. And of course we all want reliability, but at the end of the day we need to understand that it costs something. And so we're making resource decisions when we decide how reliable to make services. And so SLOs really, really do that. And so there's this, this kind of tug of war where you've got um, a service level objective and, and the service level objective can't, for a service can't be any higher than what its dependencies provide. So if you are trying to build an SLO that's a 4.9's SLO and you're sitting on top of a 3.9 service, you're in for a bad time. Similarly, your, your consumer, and, and that's gonna pull your SLO down, um, most likely. Um, consumer needs are gonna pull your SLOs up because your consumers always want something better, right? Uh, 5.9's would be great, 6.9's would be better, 7.9's, you know, ho however many 9's you can get is what customers typically want if they're not bounded by price, right? And so moving this into a, um, a discussion where there's that feedback loop is really critical. And the third thing that's gonna happen is, is new features are gonna pull your SLOs down, right? When you launch a new feature, that's where things are the riskiest. And so SLOs are constantly calibrating, you know, trying to find the, the sweet spot between these, these three forces. Okay, so uh, value three, assuming best intentions. So this is, um, this is really what underpins uh, postmortems. 
the, uh, the assumption at Google is that everyone that's there should be there. They're competent. They're doing the best that they can. And that, that, that's, that's sort of, you know, when everybody's coming to work, they're, they're sort of trying to do the best job that they possibly can. And that's, uh, that's a really important value, and that's a hard thing to, uh, to maintain sometimes when you have serious outages. Bad things happen, right? So this is our amazing world. This is, a, this is what comes up when you search for Rube Goldberg machine. But, but this is sort of the way that the real world works, right? Who's looked at a system and, and thought after a couple of days of digging into it, how has this thing ever worked at all, right? Like, this is, this is a, a thing that happens quite a lot. And so you end up with pieces that were developed for some reason, and they could be reused, and maybe it's not ideal, but that fits over here. And then we'll just build another layer on top of it. And you end up with this sprawl, and it's a very complicated system. And it's hard to analytically look at this kind of a situation and say, what's going to happen? Right? And the systems that we deal with every day are basically like this. And so um, it's important to understand that failures are going to happen. We can't figure out what's going to happen in every situation. We, we can't possibly know, you know, catch every problem in code review or catch every problem in testing. Sometimes you can only find these problems through the hard experiences of real world load and, and you know, customer traffic, right? And as much as we might want to be able to do better than that, and we should strive for doing better than that, at the end of the day, that's what we're stuck with sometimes. And so, um, so if you take this as a sort of baseline assumption about the world, and you assume that the world is a complicated place, and the systems that we build are complicated for a reason, and people are doing the best that they can, you're going to assume that things are going to go wrong. And when they go wrong, what should you do? Well, you probably shouldn't start with blame. Right? What you should do is you should, you should try to cash in this bad experience for um, some knowledge that will keep you from, from experiencing that bad thing in the future. Right? And so you think about blameless postmortems. So I would assume that most people in this room know what blameless postmortems are, but I'm going to run through it very quickly. This is basically after the fact information gathering when something has gone wrong. One of the things that's very important about this is that if you think back to the Rube Goldberg machine, People are also kind of Rube Goldberg machines. Everyone is sort of operating on partial data. They're doing the best that they can, but you can't assume that everyone is an expert all the time. And so an important aspect of blameless postmortems is assigning, assigning blame to processes, not people. So the, the, the five whys technique is really, really useful here. So if you think about a situation where operator error caused some outage, well, why did that operator error happen? The answer shouldn't be that this person didn't know enough. The, the answer should be that there weren't enough controls, right? And at the, the, um, at the bottom of this, you really have the growth mindset, the idea that we should be getting better um, at what we're doing over time. So think about postmortem case one, right? So the, the SLO I was talking about. So, so we have two, two dips in the SLO here. Clearly bad things are happening, right? And so imagine that we're in a situation where we have uh, someone has made a mistake. And... We've all made mistakes. When you make a mistake, you know you've made a mistake. When you make a mistake that causes an outage, you really know that you've made a mistake, right? And you probably feel kind of like this cat, right? You're a little bit uh, uh, jumpy, and, uh, and you feel bad about what you've done because you did a thing that caused an outage. But, you know, if you... Uh, you need to sort of take all the, the emotional sort of um, dimensions of this um, into play, right? So if you think about this from the perspective of a person who's doing their best, who's competent and was operating on the best information that they had, that draws this person into the process. You get the best possible information for why they were doing what they were doing, and you have the best chance of, of stopping this kind of a problem from occurring again. Right? So if you assume that you're doing postmortems without the assumption of best intentions, right? same thing happens. But this is, this is terrible, right? Like, this would be absolutely awful. There's no way that you're going to learn from this, right? You know, this ends up basically being uh, an expedition to assign blame, right? You, you need to find the person who messed up and, and really stick it to them because they messed up. So is that person going to learn? Is your organization going to learn? Probably not nearly so much, right? Everybody gets completely freaked out, right? You know, on the, the flight over, I was watching um, episodes of Westworld, and 
I mean, things go wrong in Westworld, <laughs> really wrong, like not to spoil it. But you know, there are all these comments that they're making about how um, the board is going to be very upset and all this, this, this sort of stuff. And, and thinking about that while I was thinking about this talk, that's so incredibly counterproductive, right? It just can't possibly work, right? Like this is, the, why would you possibly participate in that process? Why, certainly not fully, right? You would get very defensive and you, you, you would try to cover up, right? And like, this is a sucker's bet. You just can't do this, right? If you're, if you're going to have blameless postmortems, really you need to be in this situation where, uh, if, sorry, if you're gonna have postmortems, you really have to have blameless postmortems and what blameless postmortems really require is this assumption of best intentions. And if you don't have that, you're not gonna be able to do this. So for postmortems, you need to separate analysis from blame. Uh, you need to prioritize concrete action items that you can take to, to fix the postmortems. Because if, if postmortems are just navel-gazing expeditions where you figure out some things that are wrong, you put them on a list, and then you never look at them again, it's, it's not a functional process. Um, the third thing that you need to do is you need to separate accountability from the, the, the postmortem. So all organizations have people that have performance management problems, right? The, there's, there's a, I think, a hard thing to do as a manager to try to reconcile this notion of blameless postmortems and uh, assuming best intentions from, from people that, that aren't managing to, to deliver on what they're supposed to be delivering on. But that really needs to be separated from the emergency, right? The organization needs to learn from the incident, and patterns of behavior need to be dealt with in private later, right? And if you mix those two things, you're, you're not going to uh, be in for a good time. Okay, so uh, the last point. Uh, what does this mean for adoption? So many of you are not at Google. Uh, you don't have an organization that has grown up this way. And you may not necessarily have uh, these values exemplified to this extent that I'm talking about. So, you know, I think uh, the high level um, message that I'd like you to walk out of this talk with is, is really understanding that SRE is a reflection of a particular set of values, right? So my take on the difference between SRE and DevOps is that DevOps provides a broad uh, set of principles. SRE provides an architecture for an, an operation organization that works effectively in some operating regime, right? That's not to say that this is necessarily appropriate for the entire world, but if you have these values, these techniques might work for you. If you so if you have these values, implement away. Like, the, you know, it should be very easy to take you know, all the parts in the SRE book and just apply them directly. If you don't have all of these values, try to find the ones that you have or the ones that you can easily build a case for. Um, so if, for example, uh, assuming best intentions is a thing that already resonates in your organization, start with postmortems and work from there. Um, if you have a focus on reliability, you know, start, start there and, and, and work, work away. Um, and, and just you know, focus on, on the, the things that match well for your organization. And there are other organizations that are, are excellent organizations that have a different set of values. If you have different values, think about what you should do in the light of your values and what the things that are really important to your organization are. Think about the ways that your organization acts when it's in crisis. And, and try to find processes that work well with those values because going against the grain doesn't work out quickly, right? It can work out over time, but it's a hard road to change values. And so I, I think that that's really the, um, the important idea there. So at a high level, uh, SRE is an organizational architecture. I think that um, frequently it ends up being thought of as a, as a bag of tactics that you can just sort of deploy however you want. And I think it's much more useful thinking of from a sort of a, a coherent organizational perspective. These values really enable S3 tactics, and, and like I, I hopefully showed with a couple of these, um, trying to adopt these tactics without the values is, is very difficult. And it's likely to result in, in, uh, in tactics that are less uh, effective than they otherwise would be. And the third thing is that you know, adopting this as an organization really requires figuring out um, what your values are and, and what tactics match them. So that's all that I have. Thank you for your attention, um, and I'm happy to take uh, questions at this point.